Thank you indeed, Lord MacDonald. Quiet, please. Shh. Moving to our third opposition speaker and our final speaker this evening, Nathan Law. Nathan is a democracy activist from Hong Kong, now based in London as a refugee. He was the 58th Secretary General of the Hong Kong Federation of Students, former chairman, chairman of Domasisto, and was the youngest elected legislator in Hong Kong. He was named one of the 100 most influential people in the world by time in 2020. Nathan, it's a pleasure to have you here this evening. You have the floor. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and anyone who's not bound up by them. Um, very much lovely to see you all tonight. Um, I pretty much agree with what Lord Madonna has said. Uh, we should find common ground. There's one common ground of me with some of the honourable gentlemen on the other aisle, which I would wholeheartedly hope that there will be a better man in the lives of Chinese people. So I supported the White Paper Revolution. So I supported all the movement that they seek for justice and freedom. And so do I, mom the fallen in Tiananmen massacre, where these brilliant young people, they protested in 1989 just for the democracy and anti-corruption efforts in mainland China. So for me, there are some fundamental principles that we share. I hope the people of China could be like me to be elected at such a young age, at the age of 23, and to represent the people. But at the end of the day, they are unable to do so because they are being ruled by a tyranny. In this formal setting, it sounds familiar with me because I served um, in Hong Kong's parliament for a very short while. And before that, I was a student leader. In 2014, I led uh, the Umbrella Movement, a wonderful civil disobedience movement, where hundreds of thousands of Hong Kong people marched down to the streets and occupied the major runway in order to demand for democracy. In the 1980s, when the British government was doing their colonial retreat, they negotiated a contract, a, a, a treaty, with the Chinese government saying that after the hangover taking place in 1997, Hong Kong would enjoy freedom, democracy, and autonomy. But Beijing violated all these promises. There's never been any significant process on democracy. And the British government, as the single and only guarantor, said nothing in 2014 when we had this massive disobedience movement. They abandoned the Hong Kong people. They said nothing. And that, to me, was fear. For me, I'm, I'm, I have to apologize uh, myself to my previous speakers because I'm, I'm going to disrupt the line of defense. I'm going to propose an unorthodox definition of fear, and it would probably be interrupting my position. But I believe that fear is a form of submission. Fear is a form of weakness. And it demonstrated, not now, but decades ago, when the British government uplift the sanctions over China in a short-lived uh, period after 1989 Tiananmen massacre, and they adopted the appeasement strategy. And in 2014, we saw the Cameron government was too weak. They dare not to criticize the government, the Chinese government, for taking away the legitimate rights of Hong Kong people. And they did not perform their responsibility to speak up for the Hong Kong people and oversee the sign of the British Declaration. For me, that's fear. For me, that is the problem that we face because these people, they, they said that in order for our economic relationship with China, in order to gain money, they can lose grounds on their moral values. They can lose grounds on their democratic values. And that's the problem that we're facing. In recent years, what I witnessed, the massive change of uh, China policy direction in the UK, is from fear to fear. We are just fairly criticizing China's human rights record. We are just abandoning the idea that if we criticize them, we lose all the economic reward with them in order to better perform as a democracy. In 2019, when there was a big, massive uh, uh, protest happening in Hong Kong, two million people marched down to the street, more than a quarter of the population, and the British government sent numerous condemnation to the Chinese government, accusing them of violating the treaty promise in the sign of British Joint Declaration. For me, that's the right act to do. Not only for the lip service, they have also offered a humanitarian pathway 
for millions of Hong Kong people who are eligible, and there are already 200,000 of them have come to this country to serve this country, to contribute. And for me, that's an act of bravery because it doesn't fall into the idea that if we be harsh to China, then we lose everything. That's the fear that we had. And for the Uyghur's population, millions of people being locked in concentration camp, we've got testimonies, we've got hearings, we've got tribunal to look at all the facts and look at all the testimony from brave people like Rahima. And that's exactly what we need. So for me, uh, it's a bit difficult for me to conceptualize today's uh, motion. And pardon me if I make any confusion in, in, in my speech. But I do believe that we have to see China as a systematic competitor and a threat to our, to our democratic values. And that is my baseline. For me, being able to speak here is such a privilege because most of the colleagues I work with, they are all in jail. And, and it's disheartening because last time I was here in Cambridge Union, it was five years ago, I was still with one of the greatest um, uh, democratic veterans in, in Hong Kong, and one of them, they are serving jail in Hong Kong probably more than a decade because they organized a primary election, which in every country, in, in every um, democratic countries, we do have demo, uh, these primaries. They are in jail, just exercise the rights and the power that you are born with and that you are enjoying now. So for me, this is, this is not just a debate. Like, to be honest, I, I don't really care about the result because for me, I'm here to represent my people. I'm here, here to serve my people. I'm not here to serve the motion or the need of you guys attending in a chilling night listening to some folks talking about um, some noble affairs. Like, this is about me and my, I'm, and my family and my people. But at the end of the day, we, we have to look at what, what, well, there are lots of things that uh, the opposition, uh, sorry, the, 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 the gentleman on, on the opposite side aisle. Let's talk about China. And one thing that I have to mention is um, China indeed has a lot of ambition in overturning our global order and the rights that we are enjoying. Two years ago, I was invited to attend uh, Biden administration's Summer for Democracy. I, I was the sole representative from Hong Kong. And I talked about democratic resection. And the week before that, the Chinese government had a press call. They wrote out a white paper saying that China is the democracy that works. Uh, that, that really <laughs> reminded me That really reminded me the, the double thank in 1984, where China, uh, the Chinese government saying that they're a democracy, but in fact, no one elected the whole Politburo and also Xi Jinping. They said that they enjoy the freedom of speech. Uh, but in reality, I, I saw some um, Chinese idiom online that says that, yes, you do have freedom of speech in mainland China, but only once. Because after that, <laughs> you're going to jail. <laughs> and, and, and it reminds me of the, the gentleman on the opposite, opposite aisle. I, I, well, I, I was thinking, wow, that, that was remarkable. You need to have a disclaimer before you debate in a free society. Isn't that, isn't, isn't that a bit like a sense of the, 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 the transnational repression of China on, <laughs> in, in operation? Um, and also, they claim that themselves having rule of law, where um, the law in mainland China is only for the people. Uh, they do not limit the power of the government, and that is not the definition of rule of law according to our international, international standards. They wrote out that, and they said that, look, we are better than the UK, we're better than the US, we're better than the rest of democracies in the world. Um, we've heard a lot of what, what aboutism, relativism, bad things about UK and bad things about US. Some of them are, are definitely true. I, I do agree with that, but, but this is not the point of tonight. The point of tonight is we have to assess the threats to Chinese power with its rise. It's not only economical rise, but also an ideological warfare that is in operation. And that's the reason why we have to be so cautious about the threat it posed to us, and we cannot just treat it um, just like nothing had happened. Um, well, in 2014, I guess you all remember that was the golden era. And for the past few decades, we got a huge appeasement strategy on, in place where they have this conception, 
Like if China's economy grow, it is middle class grow, then middle class ask for, ask for a private property rights, ask for rule of law, then it will step into a path of liberalization and democratization. That was a prevalent understanding back then. That's the classic modernization theory. When we look back, it could be a virtual thinking, but it could be a deliberate ignorance because they just want that world factory to produce the economic reward also for the West. And I think that is definitely not the case for now, especially when we see how China has been conducting their well, aggression overseas. And I heard Professor Zhang talk about his time in China. Yes, there was a time in China that things were looking good. Like it was in the early 20s, like it was up until to the Beijing Olympic before Xi Jinping came into power. When Xi Jinping came into power, he wrote out all sorts of policies like um, um, Si Bu Jiang, the seven things that you don't talk in mainland China, foreign NGO laws, all, all sorts of things that roll back the whole civil society development uh, that the Chinese people um, wholeheartedly and hardworkingly achieved in a decade or two. So what we are facing now is, I, I do believe we, we need more assertive policy. We need to be more, be more aware of the Chinese influence. And at the end of the day, um, I've heard a lot of you talking about your thoughts about it. And it reminds me, a lot of people talking about China, they're actually reflecting the insecurities of their democracy. So democracy has failed us. We can definitely agree that. Democracy should be younger, should be more about ideals, less about money put in the election, should be more inclusive, should represent more people. But every time I get triggered when you compare the mistakes that democracy make to China or to Hong Kong, because it hasn't lived to what it looks like, that you absolutely don't have freedom of speech, that friends of you getting jailed because of just like me standing here saying things from the bottom of their hearts. I get absolutely triggered when you say that, look, autocracies could could hold democratic countries accountable. No, that, that is your responsibility. That's the people who hold the democratic countries accountable, but not countries from Iran or like Russia and trying to say like US stop bullying other countries. Like that, that's not how it works. It is your responsibility to do so. And I do agree with that. And at the end of the day, I, I, I believe that the insecurity have to be resolved by all of us. I am worried that you would, like, you would feel democracy is not the best form among all the worst form of political system. Uh, please? Um, so I, I, so I'm, I'm not expressing this in the opposition to you, but I would like, since you said you're here to represent the people, I would like to hear you shed some light on a few terms. So I would like to hear your definition of blue ribbon, on yellow ribbon, and what they are, and I would like you to share with the House uh, what each term means within the political ribbon. <laughs> Well, I appreciate your effort, but I think it's rather difficult to, for the whole audience to get into the context of that. But I'm merely saying that I was elected in 2016 and I was carrying a lot of goodwill of the democratic movement in Hong Kong, and I surely cannot represent all people, just like any politicians in the world. Um, but I do believe that I have significant support. Um, thanks so much for your point of order. Um, for us, it's indeed troubling that democracy does, do not perform, and and I am worried that we lose faith in it. So my answer is, well, being here, listening, um, cultivating sympathy, understanding both sides, and make your uh, logical judgment. And as I said, I, I'm just a passerby. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a terrible debater, so I'm, I'm not even debating for the, the, in, 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 in the sense of my notion as if um, I truly believe that we, we need to fear. Uh, fear is not good for me. I, I don't fear anyone. I, I fear death. I fear a lot of things. But I don't fear the Chinese Communist Party because we have to be brave to counter them. And that's the point. Um, for me, as we all are here, I'm very grateful to meet all of you. If you want to take away one thing from tonight's debate, I, I want you to, be, to feel personal about our, the encounterings of Hong Kongers. Feel personal about the encountering of Rahima because this is what happened if we let an unchecked government to act according to their will. And by doing so, 
you are supporting us, supporting our cause, and um, the democratic struggles that we have. So once again, thank you so much. Um, and even though I said I don't care about the result, but I would appreciate that. <laughs> if, if you... <laughs> now, if, if, if you believe that we should... If you believe that we should have a more assertive policy towards China, we should see it as a threat to our democratic values as they've been launching clear ideological warfare into the belief that is ingrained and deeply trusted in our society. Uh, please vote for the opposition. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nathan. And that concludes our debate for tonight. Um, as a reminder, tomorrow at 5.30, we host Stella Assange, and on Sunday, we're joined by Sandy Toxic. Um, could the tellers please take their positions? As you know, in this house, we vote with our feet, eyes to the right and nose to the left, abstentions down the middle. Um, please do go vote. Results will be announced in the bar. Thank you.